In this example problem, we're going to use our, our net short-term and long-term transform section properties and the PCI multiplier approach to calculate our short-term and long-term deflections. We have a standard double T section and we're given some information on our loading. Uh, we'll, we're also given our information on our pre-stressing, which will be on, on the following slides. We have some information on the strand locations and also uh, our concrete strength at release and at ultimate, the stress in our, our strands uh, before transfer and our span length here, which is 60 feet. Uh, we're going to assume that this is a roof member and not likely to cause damage to non-structural elements by long, large deflections. And this will uh, help us to determine what limits we need to check in ACI 3.18.19. The first thing that we can do is calculate all of our material properties. We have our release strength for our concrete, or sorry, the release modulus for our concrete, the uh, modulus using the ultimate strength of our concrete, and the effective modulus, uh, again, uh, assuming a creep coefficient here of, of two, uh, which we could calculate using any, any kind of uh, procedure for finding creep our creep coefficient. We also have our required section properties here. Um, so we're using our gross section, we're given our uh, net short-term and net long-term moment of inertia is about equal to our gross moment of inertia, and we're also given our transform section properties, our short-term and our long-term uh, transform moment of inertia uh, here. Our first step is uh, we can calculate our initial camber. And for this, we need, to we need to calculate the force in our strands uh, immediately after release. And here we're given that value is 415.2 kips. And this is our pre-stressing force after elastic shortening loss. Uh, if we're using our net and transform section properties, we would want to use our short-term net section properties uh, in these equations. And we also want to use our modulus at release in these equations if we're looking for initial camber. So here I, I plug in all the values um, that we need. Um, so we have harped strands. So we have a different eccentricity at the center than we do at the ends. So we're going to use this equation here to calculate our mid-span deflection from our pre-stressing. And we have a distributed load. So we'll just use our, our five WL to the fourth over 384 EI equation to calculate our uh, mid-span deflection due to our distributed load. Plugging in our values, we can see that our initial camber is equal to negative 0.628 inches, which means we have an, an upward deflection of, of 0.628 inches. Next, we can find our final camber. And uh, this is the camber, including all of our, our time effects. So here we need to look at our pre-stressing force after all of our pre-stressing losses. And we're also going to use our long-term net section properties and our EC effective, our effective modulus of elasticity for our concrete, which takes into account creep. So we remember that our, our we're assuming that our short-term net is about equal to our long-term net, which is about equal to our, our gross moment of inertia. So we have the same moment of inertia there, but you can see that the modulus decreases. So our final camber, uh, plugging in all, all of our different values, we'll have a, a final camber of 1.123 inches uh, upward. So uh, you can see the negative value there. We can also find the deflection from our superimposed dead load. This is a sustained load and it's an external load. So because it's a sustained external load, we're going to use our long-term transform section properties and our effective modulus of elasticity. So we can plug in both those values to our deflection equation with our distributed uh, load from our, our superimposed dead load. And we'll get a, a, deflect, a downward deflection from our superimposed dead load of, of 0 0.208. We can add that to our final camber to get our total deflection from our pre-stressing, our self-weight, and our superimposed dead load, which will be here, uh, negative 0 0.915 inches, which is an upward deflection. The last deflection that we can find is our deflection from our live load. 
for our live load is an immediate load. So we're going to, and, and it occurs when we have the ultimate strength for our concrete. So we're going to use E sub C, so our modulus of elasticity for our concrete, considering the ultimate strength of the concrete, and our short-term transformed moment of inertia, because it's, it's an immediate load. So plugging in those values with our, our given length and our given live load, we can get a live load, or we'll find a live load deflection of 0.233 inches, which will be a downward deflection. We can add this to our camber, our deflection from our superimposed dead load, and uh, you know, add in our, our live load to get our, our final service deflections, uh, which here you can see will be negative 0.682 inches upward. So even after we have our live load, we still have an upward deflection. The ACI 31819 deflection check um, for the type of element we're looking at we just need to make sure that our, our deflections from our superimposed dead loads and our live loads are less than L over 240. So here, adding up those two deflections, our superimposed dead load and live load deflection, uh, the summation of those will be 0.441 inches, and we can compare that to our deflection limit of three inches and see that uh, our deflections are, are okay in this case. For the next part of this problem, we're going to find our deflections using the PCI multiplier approach. And this approach that I'm detailing is uh, found in the PCI design handbook, the seventh edition um, from 2010. So you can see here in this table, uh, we can find the release deflections, the deflections at erection or when we're constructing the structure. And then we can also find the deflections uh, at final or, or when it's in service. The deflections that I have highlighted in blue are our base deflections. And then there are multipliers that we, so we take these multipliers times our base deflections to take into account time effects. So uh, the first step is to find all of our base deflections. And we need to find our at using our gross section properties. And um, for our, our base pre-stressing, we're going to use the modulus of elasticity at release, so E sub CI, and the pre-stressing force at release. So you can see here, we have our base deflection from our pre-stressing, and uh, that'll be equal to negative 1.485 inches, so an upward deflection of about an inch and a half. Our base deflection from self-weight is shown here. Uh, the modulus that we'll use is the modulus at release. Um, so we have E sub CI there, and we have our distributed load from our self-weight uh, right here. So 0 0.085 times 12 feet. Um, so we can find our, our self-weight deflection equal to 0.857. We can do the same thing with our superimposed dead load. Uh, just note the difference here. We're using the modulus of elasticity for our concrete using the ultimate strength of our concrete. So here, this is uh, E sub C that we're using. Um, so we can find the deflection, our base deflection from superimposed dead load equal to 0 0.082 inches. And finally, our, our base live load deflection, uh, we have our live load, our, our distributed live load, and um, our modulus at release. And again, we're using gross section properties here. Uh, we'll find our live load deflection equal to 0 0.247 inches. So we can use all of these deflections with our, pre, our deflection from our pre-stressing with the PCI multipliers to find uh, different deflections um, throughout the life of our, our beam. We can find the initial camber just by adding our pre-stress deflection to our self-weight deflection that we found on, on the previous slides. So here you can see we don't have any multiplier if we're looking at the initial camber. So here the initial camber will be negative uh, 0.628 inches upward deflection. For the final camber, we take those two uh, deflections, the deflection from pre-stressing, we take times 2.45, which is the multiplier for, for uh, final time for the pre-stressing. And we take the deflection from self-weight times 2.7, uh, which is the multiplier for self-weight at final time. 
So we can see we're including those multipliers and we'll get a final camber equal to negative 1.324 inches. For our, our service deflections, we have the same two components for our, our camber uh, with the same multipliers. And uh, we need to include a, a multiplier to our uh, superimposed dead load. So 3.0 times that superimposed dead load, which again takes into account all of our time effects. And we don't have any uh, multiplier for our live load because our live load is an immediate load. So uh, we don't need a multiplier there. There won't, uh, time effects won't influence the, the live load deflection. So we can add up all these components and we'll get a, a total service deflection here equal to uh, negative 0 0.83 inches. So still we have an upward deflection. For our ACI limit, we can take the deflection from our superimposed dead load and our live load. Uh, we do need to account for time effects, so we need to include the 3.0 multiplier for our superimposed dead load. And uh, when we add those two together, we'll get a, a deflection about equal to 0.5 inches, which is less than our um, L over 240 limit of, of 3 inches. So uh, we're okay here. On this slide, I give you a comparison of the two approaches. So you can see the deflections that we found using the net and transform section properties and the deflections from the PCI multiplier approach. So you can see the initial camber is exactly the same. This is because we assumed that our net section was about equal to, or we assumed that it was equal to the gross section. So um, that's why they're equal. Typically net section will be very similar to the gross section properties. So, I mean, these will be relatively similar or the initial cameras will be relatively similar. The, uh, you can see the, the rest of the values, the, they're within 10 to 20%. And this is within, a, a, I guess, typical errors expected with time effects. So um, it, it's a very reasonable uh, approximation of our deflections. And you can note the PCI multiplier approach is much simpler because we all we need is our, our gross section properties. We don't need to find our transform section properties. So it, in general, it's, it's okay to use this uh, PCI multiplier approach to uh, estimate your deflections and uh, check you, to check against your code limits. And that uh, concludes this, this example.